Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we'll just wait maybe another minute or so for, as people are still logging in and until we get started. Okay, well, uh, welcome all of you and welcome to the MINDS uh, Research and Discovery Symposium. Uh, my name's Richard Holtz, I'm the provost here at MINDS and it's my pleasure to function as the MC for this event. Uh, we're extremely excited to today to have Dr. Lorenz with us remotely from John Hopkins University. But before I introduce him, I, I need to thank a few people. First of all, I wanna thank the grads organizing committee, which was uh, chaired by Maxwell Silver. They've done a fantastic job under very difficult circumstances to set up a, uh, a, a, an entire virtual grads research and discovery symposium. And so uh, I realize it's difficult to congratulate them now or clap for them, but if you would please provide them your thanks, I would appreciate that. I also need to thank the, uh, the graduate um, government group, as they've also played a big role in making sure this happens. And so please thank all of them as well for their, their hard work and all that they've done throughout the year to support graduate education at Mines. And we need to thank our sponsors. So the graduate student government, of course, helps to sponsor this event, which we greatly appreciate. Sigma Chi also helps to sponsor this event, as well as some other uh, donors. And so we greatly appreciate the resources that have been provided in order to hold this uh, awesome event and to be able to bring in such a tremendous speaker as uh, Dr. Lorenz. So to give you a little bit of background, uh, Dr. Lorenz has had a lot of varied experience working on uh, everything from uh, the Saturn moon probe and to probe Saturn's moon Titan to um, uh, working uh, on the Cassini probe and missions. So he's got a great deal of experience in, um, in these uh, uh, types of things. And we're extremely excited to have him here. Today, he's going to be telling us about exploring Titan with Cassini, uh, Hygens, and Dragonfly. So Dr. Lorenz, thank you so much for being here. And I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, so, uh, good morning, um, and uh, thank you for dialing in. Um, I'm very sorry uh, not to be uh, with you enjoying the, the mountain air in, in, in Golden and perhaps uh, an IPA after the, uh, after the talk, but uh, we live in, in challenging times. Um, I'm going to turn the, the video off um, just so I don't distract myself too much and uh, also to minimize any bandwidth disruption. Um, so um, I'll be talking about Titan. That's the uh, big orange ball in the background here. This is a Cassini image uh, looking uh, across Saturn's rings. Uh, there's one of the small moons of Saturn, uh, Prometheus, in the foreground. Um, and I've spent um, my entire uh, career uh, working on exploring Titan. Um, now uh, three, three decades worth um, at four different institutions in, in three different countries. Um, many of you um, I guess are, are at the, uh, at the uh, early part of your careers. And so just to give you a bit of, of background, um, I uh, grew up in the UK. Well, I've never grown up, but I, 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 uh, my younger years were spent in the UK. And I did have some interest in, in geology, but uh, actually in uh, central England, there's not a lot of interesting geology. It's not like the, uh, the southwestern US where uh, the geology is laid bare. Um, but I did um, figure out that I wanted to work on um, planetary exploration. And so I studied aerospace engineering. And I was very lucky to get my first job uh, in the Netherlands with the European Space Agency working on uh, a project called Huygens, which uh, I'll talk more about uh, right at the beginning. And I could see that um, actually in the long term, uh, the 
uh, planetary science aspects of things were, were going to be uh, every bit as interesting as the uh, engineering of making it happen. And so I sort of uh, progressively morphed into more of a physicist and uh, meteorologist and geologist and a, and a bit of everything. Um, I got to build some of the hardware uh, myself as a graduate student, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. Um, and then I moved to the U.S. in um, 1994, and continuing to work on Titan, on, on Hubble Space Telescope images. We, we made the first maps. And then I got into planning some of the observations Cassini would make. Uh, I dabbled a little bit in Mars missions while Cassini was, was on its way. Um, and uh, in 2006, uh, my wife and I came to, uh, to Johns Hopkins. Um, I've been involved in, in many mission proposals that have gone, gone nowhere. Um, uh, but uh, finally, uh, Dragonfly uh, was selected last year as NASA's new uh, sort of billion dollar class New Frontiers mission. Um, I'm involved with uh, a Japanese uh, Venus mission uh, and the InSight lander on, on Mars. And just in the last few days, even though I've just been in my basement, uh, as I am now, um, you know, I've been working with uh, colleagues in, in Japan, in Europe, uh, and throughout the U.S., um, you know, reaching out from my basement to, to the other planets. Uh, we, we, do, uh, we are fortunate to live in times when society can afford to do great things and to explore. And so I want to try and share some of that, uh, that excitement. Uh, if you're interested in, in any of uh, what you learn about Titan, um, I've got a, a new book coming out with lots of, uh, lots of the best pictures from the Cassini mission. Uh, it turns out it's actually printed in China, so there are some, some shipping delays. But if you can hold out to September, it should start being available then. Um, so for those of you who don't work on Titan every day, uh, it's a world um, that's bigger than the planet Mercury. Uh, if it were orbiting the sun, we'd call it a planet, but because it's a moon of Saturn, uh, we call it a satellite. Um, it has a gravity about the same as Earth's uh, moons, um, one-seventh of Earth's. Um, it has a tilt of 23 degrees, so it has seasons. And it has a thick atmosphere. That makes it very different from all the other moons in the solar system. It's mostly nitrogen, like ours, um, no oxygen, um, and uh, methane. Um, plays the role that water does on, on the Earth. Titan is very far from the sun, so it's very cold, uh, 94 Kelvin. Uh, water is uh, solid as rock, I mean, a relatively soft rock, admittedly, but it's, it's hard as rock. Um, and methane uh, is liquid. And uh, in fact, methane is present in the atmosphere as a vapor. It condenses to form clouds and rain and uh, pools as, uh, as lakes and seas. So Titan has a hydrological cycle, just like the Earth, only it's with a different working fluid. Um, the sunlight at Titan's surface, you know, 10 times further from the sun than the Earth, is about 1,000 times less. Um, it's 100 times less because of the distance. And then the um, atmosphere is very hazy. So the, um, the gloom at the surface is 1,000 times less than uh, noon sunlight on Earth, which is still 1,000 times brighter than full moonlight. So there's you know, plenty of light to, to take pictures, for example. Um, uh, Titan, like, uh, like our moon, is tidally locked, so it always points the same face towards Saturn. So longitude, um, you know, basically the zero longitude is defined as the Saturn point. Um, Titan's a very interesting object from a comparative uh, planetology standpoint. The, um, the slow rotation and the uh, thick atmosphere make it rather like Venus in some ways, uh, but the fact that it has an, equi uh, an equatorial tilt um, means its climate has a lot in common with the Earth and Mars. And the way volatiles get pushed around um, and the hydrological cycle, again, makes it very comparable with the Earth and Mars. Uh, compared to the other moons of the solar system, it's um, just the second largest. Um, Ganymede around Jupiter is slightly bigger, um, but otherwise it's a giant. And it, it uh, dominates the Saturnian system. It's far, far bigger than the other satellites. Um, Enceladus gets a lot of attention because of its um, sort of jets hosing uh, water vapor into space. Um, but Enceladus is really quite tiny. Um, uh, Europa gets a lot of attention too um, because of the possibility of, of life in a subsurface uh, water ocean. And, and Titan has such an ocean as well, um, probably too deep to be readily accessible. But again, there's lots of interesting comparisons to be drawn uh, geologically between uh, Titan and the other uh, icy moons. 
So the, the hydrological cycle on Titan is, is just like the Earth. It's, it's slower because there's less sunshine to drive it. Um, but basically, methane uh, evaporates from the surface. It forms clouds. And there's very few clouds on Titan. Actually, the average cloud cover might be only a, a percent or so compared with 30% on the Earth. Um, and uh, some of it rains down um, and uh, forms rivers, um, probably transient rivers for the most part. Um, it looks like Titan is overall rather dry. This hydrological cycle has a, an open component in that some of the, uh, the methane uh, vapor leaks up into the stratosphere where it's destroyed by solar ultraviolet light and uh, the hydrogen part of methane escapes, but the carbon-rich stuff recombines in all kinds of ways to form lots of organic compounds that drizzle down to the surface. Uh, ethane is one of those. Um, it's also a liquid at Titan's temperatures. Um, and uh, so there's an accumulation of organic material on the surface, and there's a haze throughout the atmosphere. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, if you are interested in the development of um, space instrumentation, uh, there's a really fun uh, documentary uh, on, on YouTube um, called Destination Titan, um, sort of chronicles the development of uh, one of the investigations on the Huygens probe. It's very, very dramatic. Um, and uh, here's me, uh, circa 1992, with, uh, with less girth and more hair, but um, that's, uh, that's progress. So... Um, the year on Titan is um, 29 and a half Earth years long, um, and that really sets the pace of change um, and the pace of exploration. Um, basically, a, a rocket trajectory from the Earth takes uh, you know, about a quarter of an orbit to, to get uh, from the inner solar system out to Saturn. And uh, Cassini was launched in uh, 1997 and then arrived in 2004. And Cassini was only designed to operate for four years. Um, but in fact, it uh, uh, was uh, operated very carefully. We um, conserved the fuel to the extent we could. Uh, the radioisotope power uh, on, on board uh, would keep it operating for um, many years beyond. And we were able to extend the uh, mission first uh, for a couple of years around the equinox, uh, which was in 2009. And then, in fact, for another seven years out through 2017. So Cassini was in space for uh, 20 years. Um, the Saturnian year is, um, you know, it's a good chunk of a human lifetime. Basically, a, a person gets to go around the block you know, once or twice in their careers. Uh, one little point to note is that um, Saturn's orbit around the sun isn't circular. Um, the closest distance, the perihelion, is about 10% closer than the aphelion. And like the Earth and like Mars, in fact, um, the perihelion is around um, the same part of the orbit that um, uh, northern winter solstice occurs. So southern summer is shorter um, but more intense than the north, and that has actually some, some profound effects. Um, we, uh, we interrupt this program for a commercial break, um, as well as um, uh, some books about Titan. I've written about uh, spacecraft blowing up and uh, the dynamics of frisbees and uh, the sand dunes, which you'll hear more about. Um, so uh, yeah, enjoy yourself on, on Amazon while you're uh, sitting at home with, uh, with nothing to read. Okay, um, I'd uh, like to show this slide um, because it uh, explains in a way why um, uh, space exploration is expensive. Uh, this is the uh, Huygens probe, the device that parachuted down to, to Titan's surface. There's um, equipment, batteries, instruments, uh, radio, etc. inside this, um, this metal hull. And this sits inside a, a heat shield. Um, and, um, you know, you can see a couple of components being brought together, this back cover being mated to the, uh, the front heat shield. Um, but what's important to, um, to realize is that this operation had to be planned years in advance, right? You have to know where the bolt holes are going to be, what size bolts they are, all the cables have to connect, uh, all the software has to talk to each other. This uh, attachment process relies on this. Um, this dolly, this uh, ground handling fixture, and this fixture has to go through this door, and all that needs to be figured out in advance. So there's lots and lots of paperwork, and back in the early 90s, it, it really was paperwork. There wasn't uh, you know, Microsoft Teams or um, even um, uh, PDFs 
uh, you know, we actually used lots and lots of paper and, and faxes uh, to coordinate this activity. There's um, a particular feature about the way the European Space Agency works is there's a sort of formalized uh, uh, international pork barreling. Um, the, the way ESA works is that it's obliged to farm out the uh, contracts uh, in the same proportion that it gets money from the, the member states. And if you were a, an ESA project manager and you, you, know, you just want the thing to work, right, you just get the Germans to build it. It'll, it'll be great. Uh, but what you have to do is give 25% to France and 20% uh, to Italy and find 2% for the Danes to do and 1% for the Belgians. And so it's like one of those jokes where, you know, uh, heaven is where the, uh, you know, the uh, cooks are Italian and the lovers are French and, and the police are German and all that. Um, so you, you get the, the different parts from, from different countries. So there's, um, you know, language and cultural challenges to overcome as well uh, as the, the technical ones. Um, Huygens was part of a, a joint endeavor with, with NASA, Cassini Huygens, um, and many of the components came from uh, the U.S., uh, the batteries, for example, um, some of the pyrotechnic devices, uh, the, the parachutes came from the U.K., the heat shield was from French ballistic missile technology, uh, the radios were Italian, in spite of which they, they mostly worked, um, and so on. So it's, it's a really kind of interesting uh, process by which um, these uh, big international projects come together. So um, it took uh, uh, several years to build um, Cassini Huygens um, from basically 1990 to launch in 97. And it took uh, seven years to get to, to Saturn, going via uh, Venus twice, uh, Earth once, and Jupiter. And then um, uh, once in orbit around Saturn, uh, Cassini released the, the Huygens probe. Uh, which uh, coasted through space for three weeks before it hit uh, Titan's atmosphere at uh, six kilometers a second. Um, it um, was protected by its heat shield, a pyrotechnic mortar deployed a parachute, and then it took two and a half hours uh, to descend down to the, the surface uh, where we didn't know what we were going to encounter. Um, so my um, little part of the, the project, uh, something I, I designed and, and built in, in grad school, is an instrument uh, called a penetrometer. Um, basically, there is a little disc, this little white uh, layer here is a disc of a piezoelectric ceramic that generates a charge when it's uh, squeezed. Um, and it's sandwiched between uh, two plastic washers uh, on this sort of titanium hemisphere bolt, uh, 14 millimeters in diameter. And this sticks out of the bottom of the probe. Um, in the event that the probe would survive, and we had no idea whether it would survive or not, but in the event that the probe survived, this would, um, this would record the, the force of impact and therefore let us diagnose a little bit about the, the geotechnical properties uh, of, the, uh, of the surface material. Um, so I spent um, you know, three years in grad school designing, um, building and, and calibrating this, and um, uh, uh, probe would land at five meters a second. Um, so this sort of 10 centimeters long shaft gets buried in just a, just a 20th of a second. So, you know, I worked for two or three years on this, uh, waited for, for seven or eight years, all to get um, uh, 50 milliseconds of data. Um, during grad school, I tried this uh, instrument out, uh, just dropping, uh, you can drop it from about a meter high, that gives you the same impact velocity. And uh, the plots here are force in arbitrary units, call them newtons, um, versus sample number. So the samples are taken at 10 uh, kilosamples a second. So this is just under one twentieth of a second here. So dropping into dry sand, um, you know, you know when when sand is compressed, the, the grains sort of lock together. So you get this sort of uh, nice um, exponential sort of rise. Um, Whereas uh, wet clay uh, before, uh, deforms as a sort of more or less plastic material or a very viscous fluid, and you have a sort of constant resistance here, rather, rather lower resistance. And then gravel has a spiky signature uh, with the, uh, this is medium gravel and coarse gravel. Um, the uh, height of the spikes and their spacing relates to the particle size. So, you know, it's not a, a highfalutin, uh, high-end physics plasma kind of measurement. It's uh, very, very visceral, 
um, it's very easy to communicate to um, to the public that, after all, is the you know the taxpaying public that that makes all of this possible. Um, but it you know it lets us tell, for example, whether the uh, material has been sorted by by eolian transport, by in sand dunes, or or by a river um, river flow. So after uh, all that time uh, waiting um, on the uh, fateful day, um, 14th of January uh, 2005, um, you would think that after all these years, you would get um, you know a few weeks to carefully consider the data, uh, understand what it's telling us. But um, at the European Space Operations Center in, in Darmstadt in Germany, where the encounter was, uh, was managed, there were about 80 uh, scientists and about 200 journalists. Uh, there, was, uh, there was kind of a quiet news week and there was a, a bit of a siege mentality. Anyway, uh, we got the data at about 6 p.m. and there was a press conference at 11. Go. Um, so we all had our, our data and our jobs to, to look at just, just that. We hadn't seen the pictures, for example. So here's my uh, squiggly line, and it looks uh, nothing like any of the tests that I'd done all those years before. Um, but when we were tasked with making some sort of interpretation, uh, overall, it's kind of flat, um, a bit like the wet clay. Um, this hump was probably the, the hilt basically uh, contacting the ground so you can sort of discard that. Um, and there's this spike at the beginning. Um, so we wondered, you know, was there a spark or something that jumped between the surface of Titan and the instrument when it contacted the ground? Or was there a rock or was there a crust? And um, I uh, permitted myself to, to violate the uh, media embargo by uh, sending my, my wife a, a, a two-word text message um, just to indicate what, what I thought the, the stuff looked like, and that's uh, creme brulee, uh, the French dessert with the you know, sort of uh, caramelized uh, sugar uh, crust on top. And um, I shared that with my, my boss, my former PhD advisor, who was the lead investigator for this instrument. And uh, he, was on the, he was on the press conference, right? All the cameras of the world were trained on him. And he sort of um, slightly grudgingly uh, confided uh, in the analog, you know, this material looked like it might have been packed snow or perhaps wet sand, but there was this uh, spike at the beginning, and so something hard over something soft, kind of like creme brulee. Anyway, the, the media loves food analogies, apparently. Uh, the headline in Nature magazine was, uh, Titan team gets just desserts with creme brulee surface. Um, and, uh, and so that was, a, that was a big hit, and that was uh, fun to figure out. Um, there is at the bottom of this plot uh, mission time, 8869.776 seconds. Um, that's a very important number. Uh, it is the interval between the time when the probe fired the pyrotechnic mortar to deploy its parachute uh, during entry at an altitude of uh, about 150 kilometers uh, and the moment that uh, this penetrometer signal uh, rose above a trigger threshold. And the reason the time was important was nothing to do really with Titan's atmosphere or the parachute performance, but because um, there was a, a bottle of 16-year-old uh, single highly malt uh, here in the, the foreground uh, riding on a sweepstake for that number. And uh, indeed, my, uh, my boss, John Zarnecki, uh, was, um, was the, the lucky winner and was kind enough to, to share it with us at uh, 2 a.m. As, we uh, as we were finishing work. Um, but this is you know, really a, a highlight moment in my, my career, uh, the culmination of many years' work and, uh, and just the start of, of new things thereafter. So um, after um, looking at our own data, we also got to see the, uh, the pictures. I'd actually um, worked on, on splashdown dynamics. There was the possibility that the probe might land in a uh, lake of liquid methane, um, but it was not to be. Uh, it turned out the low latitudes that we landed at were... Um, were actually an equatorial desert, um, but we seem to have landed in a stream bed. Um, this is the, the probe uh, close up with me for scale, um, and the camera kind of sits about here. So basically, this is a this perspective is is the camera view from about the height of your knee. Um, so these uh, cobbles in the foreground are about uh, 10 centimeters across, and and you see this basically flat plain littered with what are round rocks. Most planetary landers see rocks. 
usually they're angular because they're just fractured material. Um, but here they seem to have been rounded. Um, basically, we think this is a stream bed, uh, like uh, many of the uh, arroyos you, you see um, you know, at the margins of the Rockies. So it, it looks at a very familiar looking place, and it immediately told us that the Titan is shaped by a, a hydrological cycle. Um, this was, in many ways, uh, just the beginning of a, a big adventure as we progressively uh, learned more and more about Titan. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft, after uh, dropping Huygens into Titan's atmosphere, uh, went on for um, another 13 years orbiting Saturn. And um, each, um, uh, uh, not, not quite every orbit, but uh, for 126 of those orbits, it would uh, make a close pass of Titan and actually use Titan's gravity to change the trajectory around uh, Saturn to, to look at the rings from from the top, uh, to look at them from the uh, ring plane, to look at some of the other satellites, um, to study Saturn, to study Saturn's magnetosphere. There's a whole range of different scientific disciplines addressed by uh, Cassini from different uh, geometries. But in those 126 flybys of Titan, uh, it got to uh, measure the gravity field. It looked in uh, visible wavelengths with the camera. It, you did infrared spectroscopy. It passed a radio signal through the atmosphere to uh, profile the temperature. Uh, there were many different uh, objectives and different disciplines uh, addressed throughout uh, throughout this um, this uh, epic mission. And we'll be working on the data for Cassini for, for decades to come, uh, I'm sure of it. Um, that particular adventure ended a couple of years ago. Uh, Cassini was disposed of into, into Saturn's atmosphere, in fact. Um, but uh, as I say, it's a, a truly epic mission and uh, a great pleasure to work on uh, with uh, hundreds of colleagues from, from all over Europe as well as the US. Um, over the course of um, that period, we uh, made a complete map of Titan. Uh, this is a map in the, uh, in the near infrared, basically 940 nanometers is the, uh, the wavelength that your TV uh, remote control works. Um, and uh, you can see there are um, bright areas and dark areas. This uh, near infrared wavelength is one that's good at um, peering through the hazy atmosphere and uh, avoiding uh, methane absorption. You can see that the low latitudes have these uh, very irregular dark areas. You can make out a couple of um, impact craters, perhaps, um, some streaky things that we still don't have any idea what they are. And there are some irregular dark patches near the North Pole, and we'll come back to, to those. Um, one big surprise, uh, in a way, uh, was uh, finding sand dunes on Titan. This is a, a radar image. Um, it's about 200 kilometers top to, top to bottom. And what we're seeing are ridges, uh, many tens of kilometers uh, long, maybe a kilometer wide and three or four kilometers apart. And uh, when you look very closely, you find sort of a bright dark pairing. And that's because the uh, radar illumination from the from the top of the image is being reflected back at the radar from the, the flanks of the dune. Um, basically, these are, you know, this shows that these are long ridges, and we can uh, calculate from the, the radar properties that they're about 100 meters high. Um, they're also, um, interestingly, um, not really like um, dunes that are found in, in North America. Um, they, they sort of almost flow like streamlines around uh, topographic obstacles. They're what are called linear dunes or, or longitudinal dunes. Um, we didn't think that we would find sand dunes on Titan. One, one reason was that um, if Titan has liquid, as we thought it would thermodynamically, then uh, liquids act as a trap for sand. Um, if the place is damp, then the sand can't move. Um, but we failed to really appreciate how diverse Titan surface is, how different the low latitudes are from the, the high latitudes. These dunes are actually um, exactly the same size and shape uh, as the biggest dunes on Earth, the uh, linear dunes you find in the Arabian Desert or uh, the, the Namib in, in south, uh, southwest Africa. This is a space shuttle uh, handheld digital camera image uh, looking out over the Namib to the Atlantic coast here. And you see just the same uh, orientation, same spacing, uh, same uh, same morphology, um, and we can use that um, um, that, that analog, you know, the fact that the same kind of features are seen on Earth, uh, to to go to them and poke at them and drill them and dig them 
and use uh, ground penetrating radar to understand the structure of how they're built up and how the um, the morphology maps into the um, uh, into the, the wind regime, the, the climate history that has produced the landscape. Um, and of course, this is um, this is all jolly good fun, and you, you get stuck and you you know cook, cook stuff out in the uh, out in the boonies. Um, so I've, I've got a little bit of uh, you know, field um, street cred. I don't just work with a computer all the time. Um, and it's one of the great joys of uh, working in planetary science is the, the opportunities to, to go to some of the most remarkable places on Earth. Um, what we um, have learned is that uh, this, uh, this linear dune pattern actually maps to winds that have two predominant uh, directions. If, uh, if wind blows in a, a constant direction, then you actually get uh, ridges uh, or crescents that are basically aligned with that direction. But if you have uh, sort of converging um, winds and alternate seasons, then the, uh, the, the sand sort of piles up in streaks that are more or less aligned along the sort of uh, vector sum of the winds. And that helps us um, understand uh, what the wind patterns are doing on Titan, because there are there are very few clouds to observe to to track, but we can calibrate the models we use to understand uh, Titan's climate um, with this uh, with this dune pattern, and that was a that was a whole interesting story uh, over the years. Uh, winds would be important for exploring Titan in the future. Uh, there was a lot of interest uh, about two decades ago in um, exploring by airship or by balloon. You could, uh, you know, Titan's dense atmosphere, you could fly a balloon um, pretty effectively uh, using the waste heat from a, um, a radioisotope generator. It's a plutonium fuel that stays hot uh, with a, a thermoelectric converter that turns, turns some of the heat into electricity. But you have a lot of heat left over, which is, is very useful on Titan because the, the atmosphere is dense and it's at 94 Kelvin, so you, you need it to stay warm. But you could also dump that heat into uh, into a hot air balloon, and it was fun to fun to figure out you know, how much uh, how much um, scientific payload you could uh, carry around with uh, two kilowatts of heat from a, uh, a radioisotope generator like the one that's uh, powering the uh, the Mars rover uh, Curiosity right now. Um, the, the winds um, one time predominantly in the atmosphere go uh, sort of um, west to east. And uh, you know they do form occasional uh, cloud streaks that we can we can track. Um, but I wanted to show this picture as it sort of gives a a little bit of a view in the near infrared of the uh, the North Polar region, and you can see these sort of uh, these dark splodges that kind of don't look quite like the dark splodges at low latitude, which are uh, the sand seas where all the all the dunes are found. Um, and it turns out that the um, the liquids that we were expecting to find on Titan are actually pushed to high latitude, and in fact, particularly the high northern latitude. And the reason for that is the, um, uh, is the asymmetry in the seasons. Uh, because, the southern semi south yeah, because the southern summer is more intense, it's hotter, that has the effect of sort of distilling the methane over to the North Pole where it, where it accumulates to form uh, several seas. Um, the biggest of these, Krak and Mare, is about a thousand kilometers across. Uh, by Giamari is about 400 kilometers, and uh, this little one is called Pungamari, the named after after sea monsters. There's a whole interesting story you could get into about how features on planetary bodies, including Titan, are, are named. Um, but the seas here are named after uh, sea monsters. Uh, the lakes on Titan are actually named after terrestrial lakes, which I I think is going to get confusing in the long run. But uh, but so far so good. Here's a, a close-up of, um, of Ligia Mare. Um, again, this is a radar image, a little over um, 300 kilometers across. And uh, you can see a lot of features that are very familiar um, to uh, what we see on Earth. Um, there are uh, river channels um, and somewhat straight uh, and orthogonal river channels, probably tectonically controlled. Um, a lot of the... Um, the shoreline uh, around Ligia is what, what uh, geologists call a, a rear coastline, um, flooded uh, valleys that indicate that either the land has sunk or the sea level has risen. Uh, you get uh, many great examples, for example, near, uh, near Las Vegas, right, where uh, 
um, Lake Mead, formed by damming the Colorado, has uh, caused a, a rise in lake level, and that floods the uh, floods the, the mountain valleys, giving you this very sort of dendritic um, network. So we think that Ligeia uh, has been filling up um, in, in recent the recent geological past, uh, which is you know, kind of fun to, to think about. We um, we had a, a very interesting experiment with uh, Cassini, um, and it's a radar experiment. We we pointed the radar um, once, not um, not in a sort of side-looking imaging way, but uh, looking straight down as a as a sounder, like a like an echo sounder, basically. And uh, we got a very strong reflection from the surface of the, the sea, uh, which indicated that it was very flat. There were there were no waves. And that's a whole interesting story too. Um, but we got a second echo when you plot the, um, the echo power uh, versus time uh, on the, the y-axis and a long track distance on the, the x-axis. We, we saw evidence of a, a second echo, about a, a microsecond after the, the one from the surface. And if you do the math at uh, the speed of light in, in hydrocarbons, means that that came from about 160 meters beneath the surface. So we were, we were seeing the seabed. Uh, and the properties of water are such that you, you basically can't send radar through it. But liquid hydrocarbons like methane, um, if they're uh, free of polar uh, solutes, you know, like hydrogen cyanide or anything like that, um, they're very radar transparent. The only way we could get this echo is if this, uh, this sea were almost pure methane, uh, actually methane with some nitrogen dissolved in it. Um, liquid methane is uh, less viscous than water, it's less dense than water, but within a factor of a few, uh, the mechanics are very similar. You would form waves uh, on the surface of the sea if the wind is strong enough. Um, and the fact that we know this is 160 meters deep um, and we know the horizontal extent of the seas lets you figure out that the total volume of liquid hydrocarbons in these structures is um, between 100 and 1,000 times all the proven fossil fuel reserves on Earth. So with a, a sort of geological um, perspective that's uh, sort of fun to think about. This stuff that's in these seas is basically very similar to uh, the liquefied natural gas that is uh, pushed around in these large tankers. Um, the pressure is a little bit less uh, on these and the temperature a little bit higher, typically 110 Kelvin rather than 94 on Titan, but it's the same stuff. So, uh, you know, it's um, an engineering material that is somewhat familiar. Um, of course, there's no free oxygen on Titan, so you can't burn the stuff. Um, so it's of, of limited uh, practical use where it is. Uh, thinking long term, like the uh, the movie, uh, the, the sci-fi series, The Expanse, uh, all this um, hydrogen-rich liquid would uh, would make a great fueling stop for uh, uh, nuclear-powered um, spacecraft in the in the distant future. Um, but uh, right now, it would be more exp more interesting to explore the seas themselves. And we, we did have plans to do that. Uh, there was a, uh, an effort um, uh, about a decade ago um, where a, between APL and uh, Lockheed Martin uh, in Denver um, to make a capsule kind of like a Huygens probe, but with a, a radioized power source that would let it operate for, uh, for many, um, for many uh, months or years. And this thing would uh, float in Ligia Mare, be drift, pushed by the, the wind and the uh, circulation currents. It would have a, a sonar to um, to measure the depth. There would be instrumentation to measure the composition. Um, it was really kind of a, a fun thing to think about, but uh, unfortunately, it, it, it didn't happen. And um, there were there was interest in, in reproposing such an idea, but um, the timing uh, proved unfortunate. Uh, when NASA asked for uh, mission proposals. Um, in uh, 2016, around about the time when this thing was supposed to, to launch, um, when you put in six or seven years of development and then seven or more years of flight through space, you would get to Titan uh, during uh, northern winter when um, the Earth and the sun are below the horizon as seen from the northern seas. So you can't do the direct to earth communication you know, using a, an antenna on the, uh, on the capsule. You would need a, an orbiter to act as a relay, which is a very expensive thing to, to add. So it wasn't um, practical to think about exploring the Titan, the Titan seas this time around. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and um, 
Uh, in fact, uh, it turns out the chemistry of uh, Titan's land is probably rather more interesting than the seas anyway. Uh, remember, there's a lot of organic stuff uh, produced in the atmosphere, uh, not just hydrocarbons, but uh, nitrogen substituted hydrocarbons. And it's known that when you add this, make this stuff in the laboratory and you add it to water, you can produce um, a number of uh, important biological molecules. Uh, pyrimidines, some of the bases that encode information in, in DNA, uh, amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. And we, um, we don't know how uh, you go from those kind of compounds that we think can be were, were made on Titan to the chemical systems that, um, uh, that uh, enable life to, to function, that execute the functions of life like information storage and uh, replication. So we don't expect to find life on Titan, um, but we um, uh, uh, will likely learn a lot about the steps that lead to um, uh, life's origins on, on the Earth and perhaps elsewhere throughout the universe. And, uh, and that stuff is therefore the places we would want to go are places where we think uh, organic solids on Titan have interacted with, with liquid water. Uh, Titan's too cold for liquid water. Uh, to be on the surface in steady state, but maybe uh, there are volcanic structures or impact craters where the crust has been melted by the by the energy of impact. So you'd want to go to the right places. And actually, uh, I uh, thought about this back in 2000 and reasoned that actually a, a helicopter would be a better approach than a hot air balloon. Hot air balloon is not very, very practical for accessing surface material. Um, but that was an idea before its time, before the, the nuclear power source was available, before the, the drone revolution and so on. It's, um, it's fun to think that actually the uh, earliest practical helicopter um, in the USA uh, was actually a multi-rotor vehicle called the, uh, both of that flying octopus. Um, and uh, it broke many records uh, about a century ago. Um, but if the poor pilot had to sit there um, differentially throttling the, uh, the power to the four uh, rotor blades, uh, you know, they were powered by a gasoline engine. And the, the pilot workload and just, just keeping that thing steady was, uh, was very demanding. But of course, now we have uh, cute little silicon micromachine gyros and uh, autopilots and so on to, uh, to do all that work for us. And so um, a multi-rotor flight is, is something that's accessible to uh, anyone at uh, an airport gadget store uh, when we're allowed to go to airports again. So what we came up with is, is this, uh, Dragonfly, possibly one of the ugliest um, aircraft ever proposed. Um, it's, it's ugly uh, for a number of reasons because it, it does a lot of things that uh, are really being done for the first time. Uh, it's not usual for an aerospace vehicle to itself have to fit inside a heat shield. And uh, that's what uh, drives this rather blunt nose. Uh, as we go forward with development, we will, um, we will uh, probably streamline that. Uh, it's not usual for an aerospace vehicle to have drills, uh, but that's how we access uh, surface material. You have the interesting problem that uh, you know, for a flying machine, you want it to be very lightweight, um, but that means you can't put a lot of weight on the drill bit. So there are challenges there. Uh, we have an antenna to communicate our findings to, to Earth and to get commands from the Earth. It's uh, not actually a parabolic dish. It's a, a, a flat uh, array um, of the type that's been, been flown before. We use the same gimbal to point the uh, antenna as to point the stereo cameras around. There are also forward-looking cameras, downward-looking cameras, a microscopic camera. Uh, and we have the uh, radioisotope power source uh, at the back that keeps us warm. Uh, the rotor blades uh, are designed um, with Titan's conditions in mind. The, the low temperatures um, and the high density of the atmosphere mean that the, uh, the uh, wing section operates at actually a much higher Reynolds number than it would at Earth by a, by a factor of about 10 or so. So the wing section is actually one that's more typically used on, uh, on wind turbines. Um, and uh, the principal investigator of the mission, uh, Elizabeth Turtle, uh, my spouse, in fact, is uh, shown here with the full-size rotor blade for a prototype for scale. It's uh, 1.4 meters in, in diameter. Um, some of you may know there's a, a small helicopter going to Mars on the, um, the Perseverance uh, 2020 rover. Um, it'll be deposited on the ground uh, by the rover um, and has a small solar panel to trickle charge a battery. 
Um, it's actually a true helicopter um, with uh, uh, rotor blades that, that, that pivot. Um, and but the fact the rotor blades, even though this thing is only two kilograms, are the same size as dragonflies. Uh, and dragonfly is the size of the rover that uh, drops um, drops this Mars helicopter. Uh, the, the key difference, of course, is that the Martian atmosphere is so much thinner, so much harder to fly in. Um, but uh, you know, this thing really is a really is a toy compared with dragonfly. Um, the way uh, dragonfly will work, uh, we rely on the uh, 80 watts or so of electricity that come out of the radioisotope generator, which is far too little power to, to fly. Um, but during Titan's um, day-night cycle, which is 16 Earth days long, we have eight days on the day side uh, when we can see the Earth and we can see the sun and there's brightness, we can, we can do activities. But during the eight-day Titan night, we just sit there uh, and we basically trickle charge a very large battery. Um, and the battery state of charge is shown in, in blue. Uh, when we wake up in the morning, uh, we will uh, send our, our data down to the Earth, decide what to do next. And, and this big, big step jump is, is a flight. We'll, we'll fly for only half an hour, perhaps, um, during which uh, we can um, fly several um, uh, kilometers, maybe in 20 kilometers. And then we land at a new site, uh, charge up the battery a little bit, send some data back, charge up, send some data back. Basically, you know, talk to Earth once a day during the Titan day when the uh, when the sun is and the Earth is above the horizon, and then we'll go back to sleep and recharge. Um, so we um, we have kind of a, a nice one one week on, one week off uh, operations cadence. We don't have to uh, sleep on Mars time like uh, our colleagues uh, do. Um, it will, of course, take as many years to get to Titan. Uh, NASA has directed us to launch in 2026, um, and we will arrive uh, at Titan in 2034 at almost exactly the same season that uh, the Huygens probe descended. So we can use the Huygens data to inform our expectations of, of winds and so on. Um, Dragonfly um, sits inside a, an aeroshell a crew stage, which will be built actually by, by Lockheed Martin in, uh, in Littleton. Um, uh, the vehicle descends by parachute um, and then drops out of the, the parachute, um, drops out of the heat shield rather, um, and goes to the surface on, on its rotors. Uh, we have some uh, nice animations uh, and other resources on our website, uh, dragonfly.jhurapl.edu, uh, if you want to, to learn more. And of course, for seven years, the thing is in space, so it has a... Um, uh, a sort of backpack crew stage with uh, the appropriate antennas and uh, thrusters and so on for navigation uh, in space. Um, but uh, really the fun starts when the uh, vehicle comes out of its shell. Uh, we have, um, uh, getting to the end, uh, we have a sophisticated uh, mass spectrometer to try and uh, tease apart the complex molecules we think that are on Titan's surface. It can uh, take apart actually uh, uh, rather large molecules, much more um, uh, extensive uh, prebiotic chemicals than, for example, Huygens was able to. Uh, we can look for chirality, um, the left or right handedness of, uh, of amino acids that's uh, very characteristic of, uh, of uh, living things. Um, that's a, a signature that, in principle, is um, not specific to the chemistry of life we have here on Earth. That may be a common feature of, of life throughout the uh, throughout the universe. Um, the way we get the sample into the uh, instrument is really kind of fun. Uh, we have a, a drill on each skid, so we can uh, we have a little bit of diversity and redundancy. And we suck the cuttings from the drill up through uh, a, a set of pipes with a pneumatic system, um, basically just vacuuming um, the, the sand uh, up into the, the mass spectrometer instrument. And we have uh, some great colleagues at, uh, at Honeybee Robotics who um, have prototyped this and we've tested it on uh, ice at 94 Kelvin and uh, ammonia and wax and uh, you know, wet sand, sticky sand, lots of lots of fun and ugly uh, materials to uh, to try to handle. That was a, a really fun challenge and uh, we, we think we have a really good solution. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, a geophysical uh, exploration tool uh, called gamma ray spectroscopy. Um, before we decide uh, whether to drill, uh, we can measure the elemental composition of the uh, surface material by 
uh, shooting neutrons at it with a, with a neutron uh, generator and looking for the neutrons that are scattered back and the gamma rays that are stimulated um, by them. And then you get a spectrum that's uh, diagnostic of whether there's you know, whether the material is icy or whether it's all organic or whether there's uh, whether there's salt dissolved in the ice that may tell us about the Titan's formation history. Um, and this this kind of measurement, this, this nice high resolution gamma ray spectrum uses a high purity germanium detector, which on usual space missions, you have to have a, a cooling um, mechanism uh, for. Uh, but on Titan, we can just uh, hang the detector outside in the breeze and let, uh, let Titan cool it down for us. Um, I'll skip the uh, meteorology package. Uh, we have a seismic instrumentation, a seismometer from Japan that will uh, lower to the surface um, and uh, hopefully be able to figure out how thick uh, Titan's ice crust is. We think there's a, a liquid water uh, layer beneath maybe 50 or 100 kilometers of, of ice, and we'll be able to maybe assess that uh, if Titan has quakes. Uh, we'll have cameras, of course. We'll take panoramas. We'll take pictures when we're flying. We'll take um, uh, down-looking images of the workspace before deciding what to drill. Uh, we even have a sort of uh, close-up macro camera that can resolve individual sand grains. Maybe we can learn about the the history of the sediment that we uh, we land on um, by by its texture. Um, during the Titan night, we will um, uh, shine some ultraviolet LEDs at the ground uh, because many of these organics that we think are on Titan uh, fluoresce, uh, like uh, the quinine and tonic water. Um, that could be uh, could be a cute experiment. Um, so, uh, Dragonfly is expected to operate for um, a little under three years nominally. There's no reason it couldn't be. Uh, extended if uh, things go well. Um, typically, we'll make a flight every other Titan day, so once a month. And what we'll likely do is uh, actually do a sort of leapfrog strategy where we, we take off, fly across the dunes, um, survey a potential landing site, and then come back to where we know it's safe. Uh, and then we'll think about it on the ground, plan, maybe maybe re reconnoitre to somewhere else, and then fly to... Uh, 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 to that new site if we're happy with it. And by doing this sort of two steps forward, one step back thing, um, we can always uh, make sure we're happy with uh, prospective new landing sites before we, uh, we commit to landing to them. The vehicle itself has to do the, uh, the, the joysticking. It has an autopilot, it has image-based navigation, and it has a LIDAR for hazard assessment. Um, but what we plan to do is land uh, in um, some sand dunes, uh, at the beginning, because we are confident of finding uh, flat landing spots in the interdune areas, um, and we'll uh, have both sand and the substrate material to explore, and then we'll progressively move towards this impact crater uh, called Selk, it's about uh, 70 kilometers across, where we know there is material that has a water ice component. So we think that some of this is uh, impact eject, impact melt, um, formed by the impact where some of that interesting organic chemistry um, may have taken place. So that's uh, a lot to look forward to. Um, we have a lot of technical development. We're plunging in, figuring out um, all the details about how to put this together in the, uh, the next few years. Uh, as you saw, um, I first started thinking about um, uh, flying machines on Titan uh, a couple of decades ago. Um, outer solar system exploration especially is not, uh, is not uh, an endeavor for the impatient. Um, but uh, all, all good things come to he who waits, as they say. Um, and I hope I've communicated some of uh, some of the interesting areas I've uh, had to explore on the way. And uh, I wish you uh, all the success in your uh, your future endeavours. And uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much. That was a tremendous uh, talk. Incredibly interesting. We have multiple questions that uh, have been raised. So I'll start with the first one. So one of our listeners asked, what is the density of methane, ethane lakes? And most importantly, would I float? Uh, so uh, you would not float. Um, the density of liquid methane is uh, 450 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, the density of um, liquid ethane is about 50% uh, bigger than that, but still still less than water. Um, so uh, let me zoom in here. Yeah. Um, we know 
from the um, from the characteristics of the radar echo that Ligeia uh, is pretty much pure methane. It's got to be fresh. Um, now uh, Ligeia and Punga are are pretty close to the North Pole, and it turns out the models uh, suggest that um, there is more rainfall at the highest latitudes. So you can think about um, the sea system, and there's a connection here, um, uh, uh, Trevisa Freitem, um, that links Ligeia and Kraken. So down at the bottom of Kraken, at about 60 degrees latitude, it's a lot warmer, there's a lot less rainfall. So this is a little bit like the Black Sea uh, and the Mediterranean and Atlantic. And there's um, a salinity gradient, basically all the continental runoff from the rain, i.e. the pure methane, comes into Ligeia. And any dissolved stuff like ethane, which is relatively involatile, has been flushed to, to the south, to Kraken. So if you were going to try to float, you would float better in Kraken because it's probably more um, ethane rich. I, um, uh, but, you, but you would need a, a boat. You, uh, a, an unprotected human would, would sink. I did do the calculation once of figuring out that a human being could uh, porpoise, you know, in the low gravity, you could accelerate yourself if you had a, a warm suit and an oxygen mask, at least. Uh, you could accelerate yourself out of the, uh, out of the liquid, like a uh, flying fish or, or porpoises do on, on Earth. So that, that would be fun, but you, would need, uh, but you would need a way to stay warm and breathe. Very cool. I, there are a couple of questions that relate to weather, and so I'm going to try to combine those into one. Uh, everything mm -hmm. from uh, it seems that the winds are uh, appear very linear and almost parallel in latitude. So that question is, you know, that seems to say a lot about the potential wind circulation, and that sort of dovetails with, you know, what are the impact of serious weather or those winds on dragonfly, particularly in flight. Yeah, uh, so the, the wind pattern um, that you see here, the predominantly uh, east to west circulation, which is, is actually rather similar to Venus, uh, is a feature of the upper atmosphere. Um, and you know, the atmosphere down to somewhat lower levels, but it's the, the atmosphere that we can uh, see with, with clouds and infrared um, uh, observation. Um, near the surface, things get a bit more complicated. And actually, uh, the, um, at the large scale, uh, you would expect the low latitude uh, near surface winds to go uh, from the east to the west. And that's why we have the, um, you know, the hurricanes in the Atlantic get pushed uh, at low latitudes you know, towards the west and then come up the, uh, uh, the east coast of the USA, the so-called western boundary currents. Um, but, uh, but near the surface, things get more complicated by, by the weather, by methane rainstorms. And uh, we now have pretty good models of those. Um, and you would need, um, uh, actually, because of the way the, the dunes look, uh, you know, this orientation suggests the sand transport is basically everywhere um, from the west to the east. So the, the storms play a big role in, in shaping the near surface winds. But the equatorial storms only occur during the equinox season which is you know, 2009 or 29 and a half years after 2009. So is several years after Dragonfly arrives. Um, Dragonfly uh, will be able to fly um, quite happily in, in winds of several meters per second. Um, the threshold speed we think is needed to move sand uh, and to form waves on Titan is about one meter per second. And that's, that's already only an occasional wind. So we are designing Dragonfly to be to be tolerant. Um, it will take um, it will take uh, wind readings before it takes off, uh, so um, it won't attempt to fly in the storm. Um, but every uh, you know every um, space mission is is hostage to the environment that it's in. Uh, we are we think we have enough information from Cassini uh, to uh, to plan accordingly. Uh, and then I, we probably have time for just one more question. And so it, I'll, I'll ask, uh, and this sort of dovetails in with your original probe that you developed, but you know, one of the questions is what the tar what's the target depth for the drill on Dragonfly? You know, what kind of sensors will the drill have? What 
conclusions are you planning to make from using that drill? And then two, that spike that you see in the, the, uh, that original probe you had, could that be just a deflection off of a rock because you landed in a very stony environment? And so how does that impact the drill um, if you land on top of a rock, for example, versus a softer material? Yeah, uh, great question. So the, um, the, the last part uh, first, uh, yes. Um, although uh, the creme brulee thing was very entertaining uh, for a, a little while, um, our, our best interpretation of the, the data at landing is that the uh, penetrometer struck one of those cobbles and that gave the spike. Um, so less, less romantic than creme brulee, but uh, um, a, a fair question. We um, have designed uh, the drills with a, a stroke uh, of um, uh, 20 centimeters uh, with the intent that um, uh, we're about 10 centimeters off the bottom of the skids uh, to accommodate uh, rocks if they're present so we don't smack the thing up too much. Uh, the vehicle shouldn't land anywhere where there are really big rocks because it will detect those uh, with the LIDAR and find somewhere smoother. Um, in principle, uh, the drill, which is a, um, it's, it's not a, it's not a hollow bit. Is right. We don't suck the cuttings up through the middle. Um, it's conical, so that it shouldn't get stuck. Um, but it will excavate the cuttings um, down to at least three centimeters. Um, so we will be able to get a, a, through any overburden um, uh, of uh, at least that that thickness. We have uh, a lot of resilience in that we have two drills. So if we land somewhere where one drill uh, is sitting over a, a pothole or on a rock, then we might choose to drill the other side. Or of course, we can move the lander. Uh, we're not obliged to dr drill every, every spot we, uh, we land at. Um, of course, we're going to have to uh, adapt to circumstances. We'll have far more information to work on um, in the first minutes after touchdown than we, we do now. Uh, and so we, we're planning with flexibility um, and we'll, we'll see what we get. But we, we have made some educated um, guesses as to uh, you know, what we need to design the drills to. Um, and as, as I said, they've been tested in, um, I think, in saddleback basalt. Um, but certainly the reference uh, material for hardness is, uh, uh, I think, an 80 megapascal uh, sandstone. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty capable system. Uh, it was fun uh, developing, designing the... Uh, the sort of suction fitting to, to pull up the, uh, the, the cuttings. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. This has been incredibly interesting and there are uh, a bunch more questions and maybe uh, our uh, our chair, Maxwell, could send those to you so you can see or, or maybe you- I, I, Absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm very easy to find uh, by Google. Uh, there's a few other lectures and, and things on the web. Um, there's a lot of good books to read too, but I'm, I'm happy to follow up uh, by email with anyone who wants to get in touch. Great, thank you so much. And, and again, we can't clap for you. I apologize for that, but we all are. You can imagine a loud roaring uh, crowd applauding you. And I greatly appreciate you. I, I'll, I'll bask in the, the adoration of the crowd. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you all who joined us to listen. We greatly appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. Bye.